So thank you, Shauna and Simone, for some great talks. Let's have questions. For students who want to go into this, um, most of us went into traditional geology fields. What about our more um, data-driven students who like the computer aspect? What do you recommend they do? Do they go into a geology program or do they go into a computer science program? Oh, you know, that's a really, that's a tough question. Um, I think that geology programs are changing. I think that, um, you know, I've been to an, a lot of different departments where they're asking, you know, how can we start to incorporate these skills? Because they recognize that not only are they useful in science, but they're also useful in preparing their students for uh, the careers that are likely going to exist in the future outside of research and academia. Um, knowing how to code, knowing, understanding statistics is really important. So I actually think that the face of geology departments is changing in that regard. Um, and so someone who's very interested in, in studying geology, but more from this um, you know, data science perspective, I hope that very soon many places will have a place for that person. Um, Otherwise, yeah, I mean, I think if you if you want to do a bachelor's in, in geology, there are um, a lot of amazing resources out there for, you know, data camp. Um, there are a number of different places where you can go and, and learn how to code kind of yourself. Um, I've never taken a coding class, which is probably why I'm so bad at it. Um, but, you know, there, my, my colleague, Chow Yu, who, who Simone mentioned, is completely self-taught with, with Python and uh, now has a job working as a data scientist. So there are a lot of resources out there for learning this. Um, I mean, that's also true of geology. So, I mean, you could, you could kind of go either way with it. But I think that we're going to start seeing a lot more of the integration of these, of these tools. The data-driven like cluster analysis can help us with different geological problems. But uh, I have a small question. So um, the clustering, that kind of analysis, um, has um, basically based on is ha basically heavily relying on basically on your initial database. How good is the, your initial database? So in many cases, the initial database is probably biased. For example, I'm just making it up. For example, you have 90% of the samples coming from let's say New Mexico, and then <laughs> your result, cluster analysis result, is kind of probably going to be uh, like biased, to, you know, by the the sampling database. So do you do something like, for example, to normalize this, to account for this biased issue in the initial database or not? Yes, yes. So to answer your first question, absolutely. There are, there are biases in pretty much any database that exists anywhere. So this is always a problem. Um, and, but there are a lot of ways to account for um, you know, data that's heavily weighted in one way um, or, or another. So there are a lot of normalization techniques where you can account for that, that type of thing. Um, the only time when, then, when there's a really big problem is when the majority of the data is, is wrong in some way. If, it's not, if the majority of the data is, is correct, then, then it's fine. And actually, if some of it's incorrect, that's OK, too. Because once you get, you know, statistics of large numbers, once you get to a certain amount, um, it's fine. But, uh, but this brings up the point of, you know, putting all of our data out there, putting all of our data together, curating uh, our data well. Um, we're not really talking about data resources, but we could have an entire day of just talking about how to curate databases properly and how to bring together our data resources. I think that's a critical component of doing all of this moving forward. Actually, I'd like to ask a question of the audience. How many of you have unpublished large amounts of either analytical data, other types of data, uh, in file drawers, in, in printouts, maybe in Excel spreadsheets? Um, how do we create an environment, a culture of sharing these data and putting them? Because data lifts everybody's boats. You, if you add your data to other people's data, then you'll be able to do better analyses. Is there some way that we can foster that as a society that make this a part of the culture of our society? I, I know in some cases you have to keep it priorities and confidential, but does anybody have any thought on this? And we can discuss this at lunchtime as well. Uh, so let me ask a quick, so you pointed out the problem of bad data. How do we get rid of bad data or, I mean, it can be a wind up being almost a legal issue in some cases, but how, how do you address bad data other than you say, in my private files, this is bad data, it's out of my, I'm not going to look at it. But for the rest of us, we don't know that. 
How, yeah. how does this get how does this get this dealt with? This is a common uh, issue that is discussed. So, you know, when you have a, a you know, you know community-based database, do you have a function to flag things that are likely bad? Uh, there are ways you can do it personally, right? You can, you know, you can see is this an outlier and so on. Um, but yeah, it's it's a big problem. There, I don't think there is an answer to that question. Uh, it's something that people that do data curation and database development think about a lot. Um, the one thing that I've heard that's kind of stuck in my mind is having the ability for users to flag it and then have the database curator who has some domain knowledge to be able to go in and determine if that is indeed a spurious point and have some ability to make notes and mark that when people download that data. Um, but there's not a great way to, to do that. Yeah, I, I, it'd be interesting to open up and see what other people have to say about that because it's a big problem. Uh, at the University of Maryland, um, the library does this for us, and I took all of my data toward the end of my career, and I put it in the library, and it's available online, and I quote it, and I think that everyone should do it. The biological sciences in a, a NIH requires you to make your Can't data available. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so I, I think that your individual libraries and some sort of if MSA even kept a reference for where data sets were, that would be helpful. But I would think you would find real support from your university libraries for this. They are very keen on making data available. And there's also a big movement towards, um, you know, d data journals and things like that um, and, and actually generating DOIs whenever you uh, put a data set into a database. So, so you have, actually have something that's citable because one of the issues is, why am I giving you my data for free? I get nothing from that. I, I used my funding to, to have this and now you're gonna go out and get the publications with it. How do I get any credit for the work that I did? And one, one way to do this is to have data DOIs. Uh, so I think this is an uh, incredibly powerful approach and I'm sure there's gonna be absolutely wonderful things coming out of it. There already are. Um, and I think the great thing about what you guys are doing is you're multidisciplinary, so you, you have an ability to interpret the results. There's a small danger that, that there's this issue of association, which is not necessarily cause and effect. And, and the more popular this approach becomes, you, you might get a lot of non-specialists seeing association and interpreting that in the same way one might interpret the fact that there are the population goes up in Istanbul and there's a greater number of stalk nests and there's a dangerous conclusion one could draw from that. Yeah. That's a danger of XY plots just as well. Sometimes with higher dimensions you can see things, you can see trends that show you that those are false correlations. Yeah, that's, that's a good question and that's a good point, Bob. Yeah, it's, it, that's not necessarily a function of using data-driven approaches, but what it but what it could be a function of, what it could be a problem with is when you're having, you know, non-specialists just dealing with the data and telling you this is what we see, right? And, and I'm glad you brought this up because I meant to say in my talk when I was talking about our datathon yesterday um, is that it's critical that you have the domain experts sitting alongside the data scientists. And that's something that we do on a very regular basis. We have had, I think this is my fourth datathon in, in five or six weeks, where I actually sit next to my colleagues. I have my specialty, they have their specialty. We see how we can bring them together. And, and you know, they tell me when my statistics is garbage and, and I tell them um, when, you know, okay, this, this makes sense in a geologic perspective, this doesn't make sense in a geologic perspective. So I think, you, you can't just hand a statistician or a data scientist your data and say, tell me everything about the Earth. I think we have to work together. Yeah. So I'm going to speak in my role as the Crystal Structures Editor of American Mineralogist and about data quality and quality of data reporting, which I think creates a problem if you don't have a mechanism of data validation. And that is more than 50% of the crystal structures submitted to American mineralogists done by presumed experts, many of whom sitting here in this room, are either in error fundamentally or are not reported correctly. And that's for a very controlled, a crystal structure has internal checks in the data that you have to report. Now, if more than 50% of your data set basis is wrong, clearly the trends you will see are spurious. And the question is, therefore, how in 
if people are just depositing chemical data, for example, what is the validation process before the data is, ex is given out to the community? Yeah, um, I, I certainly, I, I hear what you're saying. I think that this is an issue that we need to think about um, as a community. How do we deal with data validation? Um, but I also think that it's really important to, you know, develop algorithms and, and statistics to try to recognize when, when something's wrong, when that's possible, um, because we do have a huge wealth of data and I think we should be using it. We should be pulling it together and we should be trying to use it in, in whatever way possible. But we certainly do have to be careful in doing that, yes, 100%. And I would sort of build off of that. Uh, similarly, you know, in EarthChem, over 200,000 uh, reported analyses. Um, there are going to be issues, obviously, um, but, you know, we hit these certain amounts and statistically things are sort of okay. Um, one of the things I'd also like to mention is within the Mineral Evolution Database, I was uh, I went in to look at dates because I am an economic geologist and we had zircon age dates being applied to chalcopyrite. And I thought, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> and so I went in and I took a month, a month of literature checking whether or not these, these UPB age dates could appropriately be related within a certain error to uh, the chalcopyrite. I changed a lot and in the end the statistical results did not. They didn't reflect any of the things that I had done, so. I'm told we have to move on. Oh, Thank okay. you very, very much for this.